loved ones. This is Management 3130, Session 26. If we're meeting in class, this would be 9 April. Today is the 2nd of April, and it's the last day of freedom. All of us go into sheltering in place tomorrow. So I planned on doing this. I planned on filming at the range, and that's precisely what I'm doing. Norton is out here with his blasters. And uh, right now I'm sharing the range with a couple of engineers from Daniel Defense. Uh, Daniel, who's packing up, is uh, putting together accuracy packages on customers' rifles. And Trey is over there doing a barrel burn on, on a new cartridge and rifle combination that they're developing. Clearly, my people. So, um, the first part of this presentation will, will be non-content related. It's going to be shooting related. I'm going to take you into two physical sciences that we don't normally spend time in. We're going to talk about both acoustics and ballistics. And then we'll get to chapter 15. So let me start by introducing you to this rifle. This bolt action rifle that you see on the shooting bench started life as a Ruger precision rifle. Um, it was fundamentally good, but, but I wanted to improve it. So it has a Bart line barrel, a Timoney two-stage trigger, a night force optics, and a Magpul buttstock. So it, it's uh, dramatically improved. It is meant for long range precision shooting. Now, I'm gonna touch off two rounds live because I want you to hear the differences between these two rounds because this is a penetration into the science of acoustics. So, the first round that I'm gonna shoot is my match round. If I had to go to war, it would be this round in my rifle. This is a 308 Winchester. The bullet is 175 grain Sierra Match King, and it travels when it breaks the muzzle, when it leaves the end of the barrel, it's traveling a little over 2,500 feet per second. So I'm gonna to touch off that round, and I want you to hear it. And then I'll touch off another round that has very different acoustical characteristics. Ears and eyes, loved ones. So, you heard a, heard a normal center fire cartridge, which is traveling supersonic. It's 2,500 feet per second. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to shoot a subsonic round. I'll come close enough to the camera. This is a Czechoslovakian company, Celier uh, and Bello, and and you see that it says subsonic. This round is meant to travel slower than the speed of sound. This round probably travels at about. Uh, 950 or 1,000 feet per second. The speed of sound, if you measure it in feet per second, is about 1125, 1,125 feet per second. So now I'm gonna to touch off a subsonic round, which leaves the muzzle slower than the speed of sound. And I'm gonna put a suppressor on the rifle. This, uh, this suppressor is nothing other than an acoustical baffle. It is just like the muffler you would put on a car. This particular unit is state-of-the-art. It's a Daniel Defense Wave. It, it is just remarkable. It's 3D printed, so there are no wells. It's made of Inconel, which is a super alloy. This is a world-class unit. So give me a moment to get the suppressor on. It just literally screws on the end of the barrel. the subsonic round and I want you to pay attention to something I'm doing I'm going to continue to shoot with eye protection but I'm not going to shoot with ear protection because a subsonic round something that travels slower than the speed of sound 
running through a suppressor, an acoustical device that baffles the sound, drops the, the impact sound about 40 decibels. And the point is, it does not impair or damage human hearing. That's the whole point for suppressor, is to be able to shoot so that the, the round doesn't, uh, doesn't do damage. So let me touch off a round with no hearing protection, and I'm sure you're gonna hear a significant difference. Going hot. Mission accomplished. I'm sure you saw the dramatic difference between a supersonic round that was unsuppressed and a subsonic round that was suppressed. The subsonic round travels slower than the speed of sound and when it goes through a, an acoustical baffling device like a suppressor, it's kind. It's very, very kind to human hearing. And that was the message that I wanted to share with you. So we will talk about that later in this video. It's time now to do chapter 15. That's why we're here today. Beautiful day at the range. Although actually any day at the range is a beautiful day. So chapter 15 is a chapter about communications, and this is a big, complex, messy domain. There's all sorts of important stuff here. And, and I don't regret not having a whiteboard. I planned to make a couple of presentations to you from an outdoor setting, and this is my kind of a place. So let's talk about communications. I have my lecture notes, but I don't have the text. I regret that. I should have brought it. And, I, and I, my lecture notes don't have page numbers, and I apologize for that. But the very start of this chapter defines communication. Communication is the transfer of information. Now, unsurprisingly, there are lots of mediums. There are lots of different ways that you can communicate. And even within those mediums, there are different channels. So communications is big and messy and complex, and we're gonna see if we can make some sense of it together. So the first thing that the authors talk about in this chapter is they talk about the components of the communication process. Process is how we do something. The first thing it talks about is that there is a sender. The sender, that could be you or me or Daniel or Trey or anybody, the sender encodes a message. I deliver a message on a voicemail, I, I send you a letter, I send you an email, I text you, whatever the case may be. The sender encodes a message and then she or he transmits it. I send it to you somehow. Then you're the receiver and you decode the message. And I want you to think about the simplicity. You've got, you have these two nodes in a transaction, sender, receiver. Is it possible if I'm the sender that I intended to say something in my message but because of the way I encoded it, you didn't interpret it the way I intended it. Is that possible? Of course it is. That's one of the, one of the problems with communications is that we are fallible humans. Uh, I may intend to say or do something, but if I don't choose the right way of encoding the message, you may not interpret it. It may be something, you may miss the message, you may fail to acknowledge it, you may be upset or offended by it. So the thing about encoding a message is a big deal. Uh, there are some messages which that we can really be we can approach simplistically but most messages require thought so the third piece the third component they talk about feedback could i whether we're doing emails or phones or whatever could i ask you to repeat something could i ask you a question and say i need some clarification you told me something and i'm not entirely sure what the due dates are or what you want me to do or whatever the case may be so this feedback thing means that we interact somehow. And it could be in real time, or it could be asynchronous. It could be at different times. But the point is the third piece that the authors talk about in, in, in the communication process is feedback. Now, sometimes you will send me a message. It could be an email, it could be a phone, whatever, and I simply acknowledge it. I say, got it, on it, whatever the case may be. When you send me emails, don't I normally say, got it, thanks, or something like that? That is an acknowledgement. I've received your message, whatever it was, and I acknowledge receiving it, and you know that I received it. Uh, sometimes, instead of just acknowledging it, we, we make it clear that we'll comply. 
yes, I'll be glad to do that, or I'll have it done by Friday, or whatever the case may be. Um, in fact, in the military, there are terms that, that are specifically, expressly designed for that. If we were communicating in a military context and you sent a message to me and I said, Roger, that means that I got it and, and I understand it and I acknowledge it. If I say Wilco, W-I-L-C-O, that means I will comply. So if you sent me a message over the radio, you said, Norton, go drive that black truck. If I said, Roger, Wilco, you know I got the message and I'm gonna go ahead and do it. All I'm saying to you is when we receive a message, this feedback thing, oftentimes what we do in feedback is we acknowledge the message or we tell the sender that we intend to comply. Now, could we say, I don't understand? Is that part of feedback? Could we say, heck no? You know, you're asking the impossible, I need more time, more resources, or, or you're ugly and your mother dresses you funny, or whatever the case may be. But, but feedback takes a lot of forms, but it's a central piece of, of the communication process. Noise. Ooh, we just did noise a minute ago, didn't we? Then we do a traditional match round and then a subsonic round through a suppressor. Did we do something about noise earlier? We did. In the context of communication, though, noise sometimes is not audible. It's not sometimes we hear something. It's anything in the channel that is clutter, that has no value. Think about you being on a channel. I, I don't care if you, let's assume you're on a social media channel. I don't care, Instagram, Facebook, doesn't really matter and you see something that has no value to you. Somebody's trying to sell you crab legs or, or something stupid. Or in my case, I get a lot of emails for Russian brides. Yes, yes. In fact, I don't really understand it. I bought a car in Craigslist a few years ago and I started getting emails from this guy that would say, Norton, we have Russian woman for you. Big babushka. No idea what babushka means. Noise. Noise is anything in the channel that's clutter. You just discard it. But it's distracting, and it fills the channel, doesn't it? A lot of channels have noise in them, signals that have no value whatsoever. And the last thing that they talk about in this communication process, and it's more of a, it's more of a covenant, it's more of a promise. They say, they, the authors, Kanika Williams, say, don't use jargon. Um, don't ever use jargon. <laughs> jargon is, is, a, is a shorthand uh, we may be in groups and we understand precisely what we're doing. If I'm a football player, do I know what the O-line is? I do. But what if I just moved here from Argentina? Or I've never played American football or anything like that. I don't necessarily know what the O-line is. Accountants talk the jargon. Military men talk in jargon. Engineers talk in jargon. It's a shorthand if you're in the group. In the group, we understand what you're saying. But Anybody that's outside of your group is lost. So, so the point is, they're, they're talking about communication as a process, and, and the last piece of that particular discussion is, is sort of a caution, and the caution is for us not to use jargon, not to use words, terms, expressions that are only identified by a tiny group of people who have some shared interest. So the next thing we talk about, new topic, we we're just talking about the communication process. Now, we're gonna talk about channels. If I want to send a message, what channel do I use? So, there's actually a pretty good decision rule. <clears throat> that decision rule is, what is the nature of the message? For example, this is a principal class. Alexis White sits right there when we're in class, and I love you, Alexis, and I wish we were all in the same room together. Happily, I'm not in room 1104 today. I'm at the range. Thank you, Lord. For a place where Norton can shoot his blasters. So, th this is a scary thing, Alexis. Honey, don't be alarmed about this. Um, what, what if I were madly in love with you and I couldn't live another day without you and I wanted to propose marriage to you? Am I gonna stick that on a bulletin board on the ground floor hallway of the College of Business? I'm not. I'm not gonna do that over the phone. I'm not gonna send you a letter. We're gonna be face to face. We're gonna be inside of, of, of kissing distance. Whether we kiss or not is not the question. But my point is that message has such incredible significance to both of us that I think it has to be delivered face to face. So my point is, I'm not trying to scare Alexis. My point is that it's the nature of the message 
it usually dictates, it usually selects the channel that we should use. Now I want you to think about this. So what we're talking about is something called media richness. Some channels are much more rich than others. So I want you to think about a bulletin board. We have in the Parker College bulletin boards in every hallway on every floor. And usually they're cork. Uh, sometimes they're fancier than that, but usually they're cork and people come up with a piece of paper and, and push pins or whatever, and, and they stick a piece of paper on there. So the billboard represents a place where people can post messages. That is the least rich of all channels because I want you to think about this. There's a billboard directly across the hall from my office door. I never look at it. Every time I walk in and out of that door, it's six or seven feet away and it's got hundreds of messages on there. Now, can you walk by that billboard or any other billboard and not even look? Could you stop at the billboard because one attracted you and you read that one message? But the person who, who encoded the message and transmitted, the person who put it on the billboard has no idea who reads it or if they'll ever act on it. So a billboard, I'm just using that as an example, is the least rich channel for communication. And that, loved ones, is precisely what Facebook is. Facebook is a billboard. People post all kinds of stuff there, and I watch my wife and you and others just scroll through, and if something catches your attention, you'll stop and read it, or view a video or listen to something. But my point is, Facebook is a billboard. It's just, frankly, a way for, for Zuckerberger to get advertising revenue. So Facebook is a billboard. Billboards are, are, represent good examples of the least the least rich channel for sending a message. And if we go to the other extreme, the most rich channel is any message that's delivered face to face. By that I mean, I can look at your facial expressions, I can ask you a question in real time, I can hear the tone of your voice, I can see your body language, your gestures, and I know if the message is pleasing you, if it's upsetting you, if you don't yet understand. So face to face, and that's one of the many reasons why I generally despise teaching online. The reason I teach face to face is I want to interact with you. I want to look in your eyes to see if you understand or if you've got that thousand yard stare and you're looking right through me and focusing 998 yards behind me. So, so if we're talking about media richness and, and we're talking about channels that are the least rich and I use billboards as an example and the channel that's most rich and that would be face to face. So th those are just the two anchor points. Now inside of there, there are a lot of other places and other channels that we use to send messages. Every single day at home and five days a week at school, I get mail. I'll bet you get mail too. People send me stuff. Sometimes it's an invoice, which means I have to pay for something. Sometimes it's an invitation for a credit card offer or to buy a car inexpensively. Or, or, or to get a Russian bride or whatever the case may be. So we get letters all the time and sometimes we act on them and sometimes they're junk mail and sometimes we defer and sometimes we respond, don't we? So my point is that letters represent uh, an excellent channel but my, and it's very rich because you have documentation, you can thoughtfully approach it, it's permanent, you get to hang on to it. So letters are a very, very good channel of communication. They're asynchronous. You send me a letter, and it may be days before you get my response to it. It has to get to me, I have to read it, I have to act on it, if indeed I even act. So my point is, letters just represent another channel that is asynchronous. We're not interacting in real time. Another common form of asynchronous communication would be emails. I send you an email, you send one back, it may be that day, later, whatever the case may be. Interesting, at least most surprising, text messages are emails. They're just sent from a mobile device. Why people send things like emails for old people absolutely mystifies me. A text message is an email that's just sent from a mobile device instead of a laptop or a, or a desktop. So very, very little difference. Except people when they text don't speak English. They speak text. Don't speak so a third type of message would be a phone call. And I want you to think about this in this context of media richness. If we're on the phone, our conversation is occurring in real time, isn't it? So I can ask you questions, I can hear the tone of voice, uh, 
you you can interact with me in any way that seems correct in the circumstances. So so if we talk about media richness, the more we go from billboard through letter through email through phone, call, the more we approach the richness of a face-to-face -face exchange. That's my point. I just wanted to talk to you about channels, media channels, and how you would choose them. And the way you would choose them is your decision on which channel best delivers the message. My example about proposing to Alexis, I know probably terrifying, but it's just fun. But you see my point? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, put a bulletin board up and say, Cookie, will you marry me? There are people that do that, but that's because they think they're stupid or whatever they think they are. Uh, a message that significant, I think, deserves a real channel. And the only way to deliver that is face to face, in my view. You don't have to agree. So now, new topic. By the way, that's Trey rocking and rolling with a six Creedmoor. And he's doing a, what's called a barrel burn. As part of the development of these rifles, Daniel Defense will shoot a thousand rounds through them. Now, of course, they have periods of cool down and periods of cleaning. So they'll, they'll take the rifle out of the box and they'll shoot it for group. They'll, they'll discern how accurate a particular rifle is. And then they'll put a thousand rounds through it, cleaned and cooled, and they'll shoot it again for accuracy. And then they'll another thousand and again and again and again. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to discern what the barrel life is. And, and this won't surprise you, different cartridges have different barrel life. The 308 that I'm shooting probably has a barrel life easily 10 or 12,000 rounds. But if you have a cartridge that has more chamber pressure, that uh, has more propellant gases uh, going into the, the, the throat of the barrel, it will erode the barrel and actually the break. So there are some cartridges that after five or 6,000 rounds, you have to replace the barrel. But when you're building a rifle and you're selling it, you've got to have these data. You've got to find out what the barrel life is when accurate fall off. So it, it, that's, that's what uh, Trey's doing right now. A barrel life. That won't be on the final. By the way, I recorded some guidance for your final yesterday. I recorded about a 15 minute video and guess what I discovered? I had muted it. So I saw 15 minutes of me silently blabbing, waving my hands, doing what I was supposed to do. So I'll be re recording that. Uh, I've done a video which is meant to give you guidance on, on your final exam, and I think you'll find it helpful. So now, this new topic barriers to good communication. There are probably five or six things that the authors talk about here. The first one, physical barriers. That could be time or space. Um, when I say time, what if you work for an American company, but you have a European office, you have an office in Germany or Austria. I think that there's six hours ahead of us. So that means it's four o'clock this afternoon here, it's 10 p.m. over there. So, so that represents a barrier. It's, it's certainly hard to have a virtual meeting and that may mean that you have to use asynchronous communication rather than anything that's done in real time. Another classic example of physical barriers to communication is when I talk about space, I want you to think about the way that most people arrange their office furniture. And I'm not talking that stupid feng shui stuff. Oh, no, I'm not, none of that. Most people arrange office furniture so that the desk is between the occupant of the office and the door. I don't know why. And usually there's a seating group on the other side of the desk. That's like putting a ping pong table between you, the two people in the conversation. Um, I'm not special or important, but you know if you've been to my office that my office furniture is configured in an L in a corner. So when you walk in, there's no barrier between us. There are a couple of chairs that you can sit in, and I do that purposefully. I don't want my desk to be a barrier to communication. I don't want you to feel that I'm aloof or distant or that I want to intimidate you because I am none of those things. So all I'm saying to you is, we talk about physical barriers to communication. I even think the arrangement of furniture 
is one, and if it's your office, you can control the arrangement of the furniture, can't you? So, the next thing they talk about, barriers, they talk about personal dynamics, things that are baked into us. The first one they talk about is almost, it's almost tautological, it's almost talking to us in circles. They say, some people have good communication skills. Okay, I get that. Is that a fair statement? Are some people clear when they send a message? Are some people engaged when they, when they send a message? Do they want to listen to what you have to say and, and react to it in positive ways? Uh, are some people patient? Are some people thoughtful writers? Are some people thoughtful speakers? Or do you blurt stuff out with no filter? So you and I know whether we are good communicators or not. We know who else is a good communicator or not. But the, the point is that that is not a gift. That's not a genetic gift. It doesn't come naturally. We have to develop that skill. And that's precisely what communication is. It is a skill. If we are good communicators, it's something that we work on, that we develop, and, and we accomplish the objectives we set up. Trustworthiness. This is a personal dynamic, isn't it? Think about that. I'm gonna send you a message, whatever that is. Let's assume I'm your boss and we have history. We've worked together for several years. If you trust me, if I have credibility with you, that message will be well received. But what if I either have not earned your trust, we haven't had enough interactions for you to trust me, or I've done things in the past that disappointed you. I behaved in ways that were untrustworthy. I said one thing and did another. You see the point about personal dynamics? If you trust me, the message that I send to you will be perceived as credible. You'll think, I can rely on this. I've got history with Norton, and I know that, that he's going to be a straight shooter. Do you like the pun? I'm sorry. Forgive me. Um, but, but what if I'm untrustworthy? Either we haven't had a chance to build trust, or I've done things in the past that disappointed you. That's huge. It's huge in terms of a message being credible when, when it is sent. Uh, the third thing they talk about under personal dynamics, and this makes me smile because I think, it's, I think it's way overworked, but they talk about generational differences, and I get that. Um, I would say to you that most people, most people younger than me, overuse communication technology. Um, they, they don't choose a channel that, that's best for the message, they just choose whatever is convenient. In fact, in many cases, people choose tech to communicate because they want to avoid all direct human interaction. I know kids that will order online, but they won't pick up a phone and order from a catalog because they don't want to talk to people. That is sad in ways I can't describe. I've seen people at parties in the same room texting each other. Would you stop it, please? But my point is, I, I think that many people, many people, this is not generational, but it describes most people younger than me. I think most people overuse tech to communicate. There, there are certainly places for it. But um, what that means is if you use technology, your social skills degrade because you're not making eye contact, you're not speaking to me directly, you're not interacting with me. Your relational skills go south fast. That is a reality. I hear, I hear recruiters complain about that on a regular basis when I talk to them at our conference. Um, another thing that I want to sensitize you to, this is just me making you aware of something that comes under the heading of generational differences. I want you to reflect on something. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw a long ball. I want you to run and catch it and do something with it. I want you to actively work on something starting now called style switching. This is nothing that's gonna be on an exam in this course. This is nothing about your development as an adult. When I say style switching, you're going to adopt different communication styles based on the context, based on the situation you're in. Here's a goofy story. It, it came from a family reunion. Uh, we were, uh, I guess we were with my wife's family, and it was a big event. It was like my mother-in-law's 80th birthday, and there were four generations of people there, you know, great-grandchildren, and, and there must have been 45 or 50 of us, and we were sitting down for some kind of a mid-day and 
There was an open chair at the kids table. And I sat down at the kids table. And I was having fun. And I love them. And I picked up a little peanut, which I hate. And I put it in my mouth. And then I said, oh, that's silly. I said, oh, a bug, a bug. And I tried to spit it out. And the kids were cracking up. Well, my wife was sitting at another table with a member of our family, extended family, who many of the family members called the Ice Queen. Yes, the Ice Queen. Very, very hard woman. And um, she looked at me playing with the kids, and she looked at my wife and said through gritted teeth, she said, your husband is quite comfortable at the children's table, isn't he? And I didn't learn this until days later, and I got this from another family member. My wife looked at me, and she looked back at the Ice Queen and said, my husband would be comfortable in the White House or in Waffle House. White House or Waffle House. See my point? I want you to start working on the style switching thing. When you're with your friends, your peers, you can be you. You can do goofy stuff. If you're talking to a recruiter, an operating manager, or something, somebody who's over 15 years older, and it's a non-social context, you're in a job kind of a setting, you have to adopt a different style of communication. You must. So I want you to start working on that. I want you to realize that, that in some context, if you're at the Waffle House, you can be goofy. If you're in the White House, you need to have a different communication style. And you understand that. But I want you to start developing that skill. I want you to learn how to style switch. It's, it's powerful and it will carry you well through life. The next thing they talk about, they, the authors, they talk about, they talk about cultural barriers to, uh, to communication. And, and I want to just, I want to talk to you about that in two separate contexts. The first thing I want to talk about is within nation. If we just look at the United States, this indescribably magnificent nation of ours, there are lots of differing groups, and many of them have different values, very different values. So the point is, even within our nation, within this magnificent country of ours, we are all American citizens. The point is that there are a lot of different groups that have different values. They share different values, which means that they essentially are different cultures. One of the, one of the most talented guys who studied international culture is a Dutchman named Gert Hofstede. You do not need to remember his name, but Hofstede said, culture is defined as the way we do things around here. That's simple but powerful, isn't it? Now, do you think they do things differently in Montana than they do in Alabama? I think they do. They're ranchers and miners and stockmen in Montana, and they're none of the above in Alabama. I, I guess you could run a herd of beef cows, but, uh, but my point is different cultures, different cultures. So even within this nation, we have cultural barriers. And if you think about other nations, if you think about considering an international context, anything, even Western Europe, even Britain, George Patton once famously said in a speech to a tea club in 1944 in, in London, he was talking to a group of British women and he said with a smile on his face, he said, we are two peoples separated by a common language. And I loved it. I loved it. I was in, in an airport in London once and I was at a restaurant and I asked the waitress if I could have a napkin and she burst into laughter. And I looked at her haltingly and I said, could I please? I said, I don't know what I said that was funny. And she said, oh, you Americans. To her, a napkin is a sanitary napkin. And she was pretty sure I didn't want a Kotex or a tampon or something. Um, but my point is two peoples separated by a common language. Uh, think about how different languages are. My goodness. Out of the seven and a half billion people in the world, how many different languages we speak. Uh, think, about, think about customs. For example, uh, there, there are many, many parts of the world where making eye contact is disrespectful. Disrespectful. If you fail to make eye contact in the United States, you're either very nervous or you're trying to hide something. Here we expect eye contact. You know, in our classroom settings, I try to make eye contact with every one of you five or six times in every class because I'm talking to you. We're having a, an important conversation and I want you to interact. I want you to challenge me or ask questions or, or ask me to clarify something. 
But my point is, in our culture, we expect eye contact. In other cultures, it's, it's forbidden. Uh, for example, if you look at the Japanese, they, they tend very much to defer to people of age, and the reason they bow is they are not going to make eye contact until they've acknowledged your higher, greater place in society. So my point is there are so many cultural differences, and the truth is there are differences brought about by theology in, in different parts of the world. There are many nation states that are actually theocracies. They are run by a religion, not by a duly elected government. Iran is, is a classic example. Um, not on my Christmas card list, but, but the point is Iran is a theocracy. It's run by imams. It's run by, by, uh, by men, uh, adult men uh, of, of the Islamic faith, and they take Islamic law, shara, and that guides every decision they make. That's why women have to wear burqas, and that's why you get caned if, you're, if your ankle shows, and why you can't dance, and why you can't drive cars, why you can't leave home without an adult member of your household, a male. So my point is that if you think about this incredible complexity across the world, I'm just an old country boy. And if I go to somewhere in the Middle East or the Orient or whatever, my technique of delivering a message might be unwelcome. And we, if we're interacting with people internationally, have to discern what, what is culturally acceptable to them and we try to match up with their expectations. Thank you, Lord, for legal pads. More barriers. Non-verbal communication. The authors talk about four. They talk about eyes, facial expressions, body language, and then they talk about spatial and touch, and I'll get to that in a moment. So, non-verbal communication. Can I smile at you with my eyes? I can. Can I glare at you? Can I look away? as if I'm hiding something or I'm distressed or whatever the case may be. There's actually a biblical passage that says the eyes are the windows to the soul. That's worth reflecting on. So my point is, when we talk about nonverbal communication, eyes can send powerful messages. Sometimes it's deliberate and sometimes the eyes just reflect whatever emotions we're feeling. And that's important. That's important if you want to become a good communicator. Think about fa facial expressions. Um, sometimes they're not, they're not accurate, like I've, I've, I have friends who tell me that they have a mean resting face. I don't know if I do or not, because my face doesn't rest a lot. But if I'm just, if I'm driving or just working my desk, I think the corners of my mouth go down a little bit. I'm not frowning, I don't have a frowny face. I didn't just step in a pile of poo, or whatever the case may be. But facial expressions are powerful, aren't they? Can you see warmth in my face? Can you see anger? Can you see uncertainty or whatever the case may be? You can, that and more. Body language. I just realized as I'm looking at the camera that I'm leaning forward and I'm leaning forward because I'm engaged. I want this presentation to be meaningful to you. I want you to enjoy it. I want you to get good stuff out of it. I want you to be well prepared for whatever comes up next, whether it's a test or the next course in your progression or whatever. So body language, what if, I, what if I sat back and I locked my arms across my chest? Does that strike you that I'm engaged, that I wanna be part of this conversation? No, it doesn't, does it? Um, there are ways to simply relax. I could, I could put an elbow up and cross my legs and I'm just relaxed, would you agree? If I'm leaning forward, I'm plugged in. I'm keenly interested in whatever it is you and I are doing. So the thing about body language, you don't miss it and I don't miss it. But the point is, sometimes we don't do it purposefully. It's just our bodies, our holistic self, presenting a reaction to something that you said or did. So I want you to be sensitive. If, you, if you're trying to cultivate skills as a good communicator, I want you to be sensitive to body language. And then the last thing they talk about is they talk about spatial and touch. I, I guess the spatial piece, I, I should have reread the text instead of just referring to my notes before I presented this. I think the spatial piece is, is almost what we are dealing with right now, social distance. Y'all, I hug my friends, I hug my men friends, I hug my adult son, I'm a hugger. But if I, I will never ever put an arm around you if I don't, if I'm not pretty sure that you want me to be hugged or if you're gonna hug me. 
I mean, I, people often stiffen or back off, and I get it. I'm not a masher. I'm not going to get up there and crush you. So my point is, my bias, my natural tendency, is every time I greet you or meet you is to shake a hand when we meet and when we leave, or to hug you, or both. So my point is, I'm not very good at this spatial thing and keeping space between us. That's my nature, and, and most people are, are not uncomfortable with it. But if I ever sense that you are, believe me, I'll give you distance. And the touch thing. Um, I touch people often, never in ways that I think make them uncomfortable. I may touch you on the forearm, on the shoulder, something like that, but, but that's because I'm comfortable doing that. And it's meant, it's meant to be warm. It, it's meant to, to literally, physically connect us. I'm not doing it for any other purpose, but there are people who don't like that. And I will quickly, usually, figure out if someone is, is stiff or uncomfortable, I won't do it. But my point is, when we talk about nonverbal communication, uh, I've actually been talking with people in, in a small group, and I'll lean towards them and I'll watch them actually back up. It's like they have this 30 inch race, like two and a half feet or whatever, and if I get any closer, they're gonna back up. And, and I pick up on that pretty quickly. So. This thing about the spatial component, you know, how close are we in space? Right now, we're all socially distant. Son of a gun, I hate it, I do. I want to get back to hugging people and shaking hands and going to the coffee shop and, and generally misbehaving in public. Um, and, and then, of course, the thing about touching. Some people are very comfortable with it. Other people are horrified by it. And, and we just have to try to be good readers. Uh, I have a bias towards handshakes and hugs. If I think somebody doesn't want that, I'm not going to force myself on it. Similarly, if in a normal conversation I touch you, it's a, it's a simple, innocent form, direct connection. But if I pick up on the fact that you recoil or you stiffen, well, I'm an idiot if I persist. So you have to be sensitive to this spatial component of differences and, and to the touch piece. You really do. Where am I now? I need a little baby desk here, don't I? That wasn't in the budget this year. Ooh, the last one they talk about barriers, they talk about gender differences, and I'm not sure that I can competently tell you about gender differences in communication. First of all, I don't study communications. That's not my discipline, it's not my domain. But here's something that's a lifelong observation. In the first place, in my academic training, my academic experience, which is coming up on 30 years, I've actually tried, because my, my research interests are primarily in entrepreneurship and leadership, I haven't initiated these studies, but I've been very attentive to studies which try to detect differences between men and women in either leadership or entrepreneurship, and there are almost no data that show any differences in the way men or women engage in entrepreneurial behaviors or leadership behaviors. We might be slightly different interpersonally, but only slightly different. So the point is, if, I, if I've been studying for 25 or 30 years, looking, actively looking for differences between men and women in entrepreneurship and leadership, and the literature doesn't support that, it probably doesn't exist. Um, here's what I want to point out, and it's something that you know. As children, we are socialized differently. There's nothing, yes, I get it that we're biologically different. I can't breastfeed, no big deal. I also can't sew very well. I can do buttons, but that's about it. A darn good cook. And you want me on your side on the gunfight. Yes, we have biological differences, but my point is, as children, we're socialized differently. Um, if you are a little girl and you're playing with a little figure, in your hand, you have a doll, don't you? If you're a little boy and you have a figure in your hand, you don't have a doll because you're a man. You have an action figure. Really? You have a damn doll, don't you? But you see my point? We're socialized differently. Society has different expectations. Girls play with dolls, boys play with action figures. When you're a young adult, if a woman wears a chain around her neck, it's a necklace neck lace frail feminine delicate if a man wears the same gold around his neck it's a chain it's tough and unyielding are you kidding me it's the same piece of jewelry 
So my point is, we may be socialized differently as children, but in terms of our differences in communication, it, the literature of entrepreneurship and leadership is almost devoid of any studies that can point to a detectable difference between the way men and women lead or engage in entrepreneurial behaviors. And I think the same may be true for communication. My lifelong observations, I don't think we communicate differently. As children, we are socialized differently. Society holds us to different standards of behavior or expectations, but I don't think we communicate differently. So I really have nothing that I can share there. New topic. I don't know what the time is. I can't, I can't read the elapsed time on the camera from here. New topic in the text. I don't have a page number. There's a fairly robust discussion about social media. Now, I want to point something out that I think is useful. <clears throat> if I were still in business, I promise you I would have a significant presence in social media. I, I would keep the content fresh, updated. I would be responsive to people's concerns or, or inputs or feedback. If I were in business, I'd have a significant presence on social media. I would not be on Instagram, believe me, saying, oh, look at my amazing pancakes. But I would have a significant presence on social media. Now, the reality is, I think it would be more accurate to call social media anti-social media. And the reason I say that is the design of every social media platform and every device that we use to access those platforms, the design is so that we purposefully, intentionally avoid any direct interaction with people. Social media would more properly be called anti-social media because it's design. Our interactions, the whole interface piece, everything, the platform and the device, literally takes us away from any direct interaction with people. And that's damaging. That is really damaging because we, if we spend our time in a digital world, we're not spending our time in a real world. The only way we build relationships is to spend time in a real world, interacting with people. So really, I'm not a fan of social media. And, and the truth is, so much of social media has no meaningful or legitimate purpose. It is trivial and non-significant. I have a friend, a friend on this faculty who has an adult daughter going to college somewhere, and when they go out, nobody gets to eat until she gets her phone active because she'll look at her dad and her mom and say, the phone eats first. We have to take pictures of our food before we do anything. Would you stop it? I was in a steak and shake about a year ago or so in Cooler, and uh, I think I was over there for a doctor's appointment or something, I was grabbing lunch because those are my people. You have to love a place where the name says dead cow and ice cream. You gotta love that. So I was in Steak and Shake having a healthy lunch, cheese hamburger and a chocolate shake, and uh, yes, fries as well. And there were four kids at another table, and three of them had hair colors that don't exist in nature. And one of them had a selfie stick, and, and he put his phone on video on the selfie stick, and he was sort of traversing the table, watching his lunch mates eat their french fries and drink their shakes. And I thought to myself, who precisely is going to watch that video? It's a question worth asking. There's an awful lot of stuff on social media that is just dumber than, than a bag of hammers. And, and that devalues it. As I said, if I were in business, I would have a presence on social media. And it would be robust, it would be significant, but it would be targeted, it would be meaningful. It would be purposeful. It wouldn't need, the phone wouldn't eat first. And so, the, uh, the text, and I don't have a page number and I apologize for that. The text now moves to a discussion about the downsides of social media. And the first thing it talks about is cyber loafing. Okay, there are lots and lots of empirical studies, lots of data that suggest most people, not, not just uh, Gen Z, not just millennials, but most people probably under the age of 45, most people, if, if we use that as a break point for age, provably spend five or six hours a day on devices which have nothing to do with work or school. Five and a half or six hours a day. That's roughly how much sleep I get every night. Five and a half or six hours. 
But my point is that that is an enormous amount of waking hours that is just thrown away. And cyber loafing, the implication is you're at work, but you're screwing off. You know, you're scrolling through stuff on your phone or playing, you know, Candy Crush or whatever it is that you do for leisure. See, that's British for leisure. I can actually talk British. I can say Jaguar, aluminium, speciality. Huh? You didn't know that. It's a gift. It's, I've only got those three words, but I can talk British. So they talk about cyber loafing. That means you're on the job and you're wasting time. Not a good thing to do. Cybersecurity. Gosh, I'm not even going to... I'm almost powerless at, at describing the number of hacks because so many times that a, a, a database is breached, there are millions of datum points in there. Uh, personal information, credit information, health information, just all the time. Hotels, credit reporting agencies, the Office of Personnel Management of the U.S. government, banks like uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, Lowe's, or, or one of the big, uh, it was either Lowe's or Home Depot, had a huge, you know, 200 million uh, customer accounts compromised. I can't, I'm just stunned by the number of data breaches, I really am. So cybersecurity is, is a legitimate downside, um, in part because most social media, people reveal a great deal about their personal lives. And, and that, that tends to be a, a, a downslope. There's no good outcome there. The next thing they talk about specifically is they talk about privacy and identity theft. And of course, that those are clearly related. Those concepts are clearly related to cybersecurity. And what they point out in the text is that we, you and I as individuals, are often our own worst enemies. What if you go to Cabo, you're on spring break, and you post vacation pictures in real time? Do I know now that you're in Mexico and you're not home? I do, don't I? Um, I want to tell you a story that comes from my years practicing. This, this is taking us back 35 years ago or so to Atlanta. Excuse me. <coughs> At the time, my practice was in Roswell. I had an office there for eight or nine years. And I had some friends who got theater tickets in the mail. They got theater tickets to some neat show in town. It was opening week or something like that. And there was a handwritten note. And it just said, from an admirer. And they thought, how cool is this? So whatever that night was, Friday night at 7.30 or so, they're at the theater, they enjoy the show for two and a half hours, they go out for dessert and coffee afterwards, and they get home at 11, and their house has been ransacked. Jewelry, guns, some artwork, um, some electronics, uh, just anything of value was taken out of the house that was mobile. And there was a handwritten note on the breakfast table, and it said, from your admirer. Some thief sent them theater tickets, he knew the day and the hour that they would not be at home, and he had about two and a half or three hours to clean the place out. I say he, I have no idea if this was a person acting individually or if it was a, a team event. But you see my point? Uh, when, you, when you reveal stuff in real time about where you are, I know where you're not. Um, and, and again, there are so many other things there where, where family safety is compromised and, and, and stuff like that. So um, I would have concerns because my understanding is the current generation, the iPhone, the iPhone X, 10th generation, uh, I think it requires facial recognition to unlock. And if I'm right about that, if that's what your phones require, that means that your face and all of its, all of its data points are in the cloud somewhere, which does not speak well to your privacy or, or personal security. So now, new topic, email. Daniel, y'all saddling up? Okay, great to see you, man. Always is. Thanks, Bye, Trey. Take care, brother. Y'all be safe. Remember, is it safe sex or social distance? I always get them confused. <laughs> Y'all have a great day. You as well. Um, email. Email is inescapable because that is the platform where, where businesses communicate. You and I probably get a lot of personal stuff as well. Daniel just fired up his taco. I'm going to wait until he rolls off. There goes a Tacoma. Email is inescapable. Uh, I don't know why people dread it. Uh, it's just a communication form. All of us get way too much. I get, gosh, I get 200 messages a day at home that are trash. I get a comparable number at university that, that I don't have to act on. I'll often see who the sender is in the subject line and I'll just hit delete. But 
email is how we communicate in organizational settings. There's no better platform. There are people who are trying that, like Stack and some others, but it, it is in no way superior, not at all. Um, it's just sort of a, a, a queuing sort of a tech. So I want to share with you, since email is inescapable, since we have to communicate with it in an organizational setting, I want to share with you my decision rule for sending an email. This is my rule. You don't have to buy into it. This is not in the textbook, but I, I think you'll find it to be uncommonly workable. There are three criteria. If any one of these criteria are met, I do not use I do not use email as the channel. If I'm going to send, if I have to send a message and it's complex, I'm not going to use email. I will sit down with you. I'll provide you with a document or something like that because the message is complex. If the message is going to be long, I know that is subjective. But if the message is going to be long, I'm not going to use email. Email to me is meant for sort of tight exchanges and. Uh, to me, this is this is another deal breaker. If a message is going to be emotional, I don't use email. So those are my criteria. Those are my decision rules. If, if any message is going to be either complex or long or emotional, email is not the right channel. If you think back to that that concept we talked about earlier today about media richness, you have to decide the best channel based on the message that you're going to send. Alexis, honey, I'm not going to propose to you again. But you see the point? You decide based on the message. Can I send this? Could it be asynchronous? Should it be a letter where somebody has a permanent record? They can take a week to respond. Do I have to talk to you right now? Um, so my point is, you'll develop your own rules for sending emails. Uh, the ones that I use, I find to be quite, quite functional. Uh, and, and I never break them. I do not send messages that are complex, long, or emotional via email. I'll find some other channel. Now, there are two things in the text, and I, I deeply regret that I don't have the text with me and I neglected to write the page numbers down. Somewhere right after this discussion about email in chapter 15, there's a discussion about texting, and there are five decision rules in the text that would tell you when that's appropriate to use in an organizational context. Uh, there, there are some times where, where urgency, in fact, if you think about it, uh, one of the reasons that I, that I have a voice only phone is, first of all, I don't wanna deal with the volume of text messages. My daughter sends and receives about 3,500 text messages a month. That's well over 100 a day. I don't have the time or the inclination to do that. So part of it is time management, but the other thing is related to that, and, and that is that typically, if you send a text message, you expect an immediate response, immediate. Well, that's why my phone is voice over. I'm happy to talk to you anytime you want to reach out, but there are times where it will have to go to voicemail. I'm in a meeting and I can't interrupt it. I'm in class, I'm not gonna take your call. So my point is, I refuse to have you put a ring in my nose and tug me around because you expect a response in the next 15 or 20 seconds. You're not that important. But many people have a truly inflated self-worth and they demand that. Well, demand it from somebody else, trooper. So my point is that there's a discussion about five reasonable decision rules for texting in an organizational context embedded in the text and I simply regret that I don't have the page number there. And right after that, there's a thoughtfully developed table. If my notes are correct, it's table 15.8. I hope they are. And I think it's a thoughtfully developed uh, policy on social media. Um, you know, how you should use it in an organizational setting and that sort of thing. So again, good, good content. And I hope you've read the chapter because that is one of your responsibilities as part of your, your self-study agreement with me. You have to read and reflect and, and learn via the textbook. A um, couple more concepts. The next concept that the authors talk about is they, they make it clear that we should never, never, I mean, that's their perspective and I agree with them. We should never send a message that that is purposefully hostile because the response will hands down be a defensive response or combative response. Um, there are so many ways to send messages that are hostile um, think about this. If you use absolute terms, if you say, 
you never get anything right or you are always screwing off or whatever you say if you use absolutes always never things like that that pushes people into a corner they have to defend themselves because you've essentially attacked them you've made it an ad hominem attack you've attacked the individual you're not discussing or debating a, a, a something that could work but but you're you're creating a situation where they have no choice but to respond defensively um, so if you send a message that's hostile, it's going to provoke a defensive response. Never a smart thing to do. Never. Never, never, never. And again, that's sufficiently important that it made its way into the textbook. Because again, in an organizational setting, you can't, you can't apply the same standards or rules that you would if you were texting family members or friends. Because you're accountable. So be sensitive to that. Do not ever purposefully send a hostile message. You can express concerns. You can say, we need to meet and resolve this. But if you send me a message and it says, you're ugly and your mother dresses you funny, I'll laugh and agree with you. But there are some people who would be deeply distressed by that because they perceive it as an attack. Now, the opposite side of sending a hostile message is a discussion in the text about empathy. Oh my gosh, empathy is such a big deal. Here's the definition embedded in the textbook. Empathy is the ability to recognize and understand another person's position or perspective or needs. And there's not nearly enough empathy in our world today. Sadly, we, we live in a culture that, that thinks that people think they have the right to cancel others. If you simply disagree with something I said, not only do you think you can shout me down, but you expect me to resign from my job and, and be humiliated for the rest of my life. Ain't happening, brother. I will not tolerate the cancel culture, but many people are intimidated by it. I'm not. But you see my point? There's no empathy there. Can you and I have different opinions? Can we have different views of the world? Of course we can. Can I listen to you? Can I be sensitive to your needs? I don't have to agree with you. I don't have to accept whatever it is that you're doing, but I can be empathetic. And the truth is, to some degree, that guides my behavior. Because many of you come to me with situations which if I just looked at our classic relationship, instructor-student, I could say, look, Goober, here are the responsibilities, here are the due dates, carry them out or not. Get a good grade or not. Could I do that? I could, and I'd be a complete butthole. So my point is that I think that I live in a world where empathy flourishes. I do. I'm flawed and imperfect, but, but I'm pretty empathetic. Uh, lots of kids come to me with all sorts of problems that have nothing to do with school. Uh, I had a kid recently that came to me and he had to go to, to Atlanta for his third DUI. Oh dear. I've had kids miss important dates because they were in the Bullock County Jail. Uh, things with family problems and personal crises and physical abuse and car accidents and health problems and all kinds of stuff. I promise you, if you come to me with a challenge in front of you or a problem that is outside of your control, you're going to get 160% empathy from me. If you come to me and you're characterless, or you're a slacker, not quite so high, not, not quite so much. But you see my point? Empathy definitionally is the ability to recognize and understand someone else's position, needs, perspective. That shouldn't be difficult. It shouldn't ever be difficult. And, and how we react is going to be situational every single time. But empathy is a virtue, and I want all of us to develop it me included. Now, a lot of content in this chapter. Now we're talking about being an effective writer. And um, what I'm going to share with you is a blend of what's in the text and what I think I've discovered over many years of writing. When I say many years of writing, I'm now in year 28 of an academic career. And a very big part of my job is scholarship. I have to publish high quality research in well regarded journals on a regular basis. And these articles are always peer reviewed. So everyone who looks at them is hypercritical. Did you write well? Was it theoretically sound? Did you develop the argument? Did you make a new contribution? If there is empiricism, is it robust? Good methodology, good analytics, good interpretation, good application. Um, writing well is difficult. All of us are capable of it, but it's difficult. So here's Here's what they say in the text, and it's just so simple and so powerful. Start with your purpose. Don't make me read four pages to find out what you're trying to accomplish. 
I would like to introduce you to the mechanics of an internal combustion engine. That's my opening sentence. What did I say with the rifle thing? I said, we're gonna talk about two sciences, acoustics and ballistics. When I say ballistics, ballistics is the science of a projectile in flight. And we talked about two kinds, didn't we? We talked about a bullet that travels at supersonic speeds, leaves the muzzle at 2,500 feet per second. And then we talked about a bullet that is subsonic, probably 900 or 1,000 feet per second. So ballistics is the science of a projectile in flight. Acoustics is the science of sound. That's how we started. When I showed you the rifle, I said, that's what we're gonna talk about, those two physical sciences, and then we went on and did stuff. I told you about the cartridges and the rifle and the suppressor, but I hope I did what it says here. I'm not writing, but it says, start with your purpose. Don't make me wait for pages to, to, to reveal what you want to accomplish. The second, excuse me, the second thing that they talk about, and I can't remember if this is me or the text, I want you to consider always writing simply. I have found throughout my entire adult life, every time I take a written message and I simplify it, I revise it in a way that simplifies it. Every time I do, it sharpens the message. It makes it more clear. It makes it easier to understand. I've seen single sentences that would go on for half a paragraph, and I get so lost in the phrases and in the conjunctions and in the relationships between these component pieces that I'm often in a fog. Ernest Hemingway was a fiction writer, published for years, well thought of. Um, one of the reasons that Hemingway is so well thought of decades after his death, I think he might have died in 65, but I don't remember. But um, some of his early writings were in the 20s. Uh, the Sun Also Rises, I think, was published in 1924, which makes it almost a century old. So here's a guy that writes fiction, primarily short stories, but some books. And Hemingway today is, is regarded as an extraordinary artful writer because he wrote in simple declarative sentences. I remember he wrote an article about an African safari and one of his sentences was, I shot the pig. Okay, four words, I shot the pig. We know the object, we know the subject, we know the action. I shot the pig. I don't give a crap about shooting swine. My point is, I want you to understand that, that my, as an adult, this, this 30 year journey that I'm on in academia, I've discovered every single time I take a document, it could be a letter, an email, a, a high quality research paper, every single time I, I simplify it, I make the message more easy to understand, it's more powerful, it's sharper, it's crisper. So I want you to consider writing simple. Put together simple declarative sentences and I'm never gonna miss your message, am I? Never. <clears throat> ah, this is something that comes out of the text and I think it's pretty useful. The text says, watch emotions when you're writing. Watch emotions, because not everybody shares our values, agreed? I treasure you, I do, I wish we were together now. But I can promise you, across this room, if everyone were here, there are 51 of you, and I promise you, on, on some dimensions, we probably have 52 different value sets. Each of us strongly believes in something different, and I'm never going to impose my values on you, you know that. You know them within about seven or eight seconds of us getting together, but I don't force my values on you. But my point is, since we have different values, if you're being emotional, if you're, if you're doing something from the heart, and if I have a different value system, I'm gonna be put off by what you have to say. So I'm not saying that you could never, that you should always purge all emotions from your writing. Sometimes that needs to be deliberate. But I want you to be reflective about it. In fact, I'll tell you something that I do. If I receive an email from anybody, friend, business, colleague at work, student, if it upsets me, I write a response to my email at home. Because if I hit send, is there any damage done? The bullet has left the barrel if I hit send. I can't recall it, can I? So my point is, if, I'm, if I receive an email and it distresses me somehow, I may even wait a day before I respond, but I will always draft a response and I'll send it to my home email. And then I'll read it, 
and I may revise it or I may dump it. I may say this wasn't worth responding or I may say that is precisely what I need to say in this circumstance. And then I'll forward it to whomever the, uh, the intended recipient was. So my point is that, that uh, I have emotions too and, and sometimes they're unhealthy. I would say that I'm way too quick to get angry. I think I control it reasonably well, but that is almost a default emotion for me. So be very sensitive, be very careful to having emotion in your writing because sometimes it's the right thing to do, but other times you will not deliver the message, you will alienate people, and that's probably the opposite of what you intended. Rule number four, please do not ignore basic composition and syntax skills. Don't do it. Don't think that you can weave in your text messaging writing with, with uh, anything else, with anything else, because you can't. You can't. I, uh, there are so many things that are so simple. In fact, recruiters look for this. When they're scanning transmittal letters and, and where they're looking at resumes, they're, they're looking to eliminate people by aspect. And if they see that you're sloppy, if they see that you have misspellings, uh, composition or syntax errors, Here's what the, they'll, I've, I've heard 60 recruiters say this to me directly. I think this job really matters to this kid. And since this is a high priority event, getting this job, the resume or the transmittal letter was loaded with errors. And since this job matters, I think that that reflects their work product. They're going to be sloppy or unfocused or whatever. And I don't want to hire somebody like that. I will never forget years ago in Atlanta when I was practicing as a CPA. We were hiring for staff accountant. And uh, I got a letter from a young man who had gone to some school in the Atlanta area. It might have been Kennesaw State or Georgia State, I don't really remember. But he'd gone to a good business school, an accredited school, a county degree in Atlanta. And the first letter of his, uh, forgive me, the first paragraph of his transmittal letter was just, uh, Dear Mr. Norton, I've just read the ad in the Journal of Constitution, I'm really interested. Second paragraph, first sentence, I done real good in school right to the shredder. I didn't read the second sentence of the second paragraph. I done real good in school. So when you have, when you have a mismatch between subject and verb, gone, bad syntax. Uh, if you do the same thing with, with the pronouns and nouns, um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen, because I'm an educator, I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody say, each student should do their best. Okay, each student is singular. There is a plural pronoun, dumber than a rock. Each student should do their best. No, each student should do his or her best. Now, if you said all students should do their best, is it correct? Of course, but just those simple things of syntax. I mean, I'm okay if you use semicolons and I don't, but if you mix up subject and verb, if you mix up uh, collective and, and individual pronouns, those are the most basic things in composition and syntax. And what it suggests is that you're sloppy, that you don't care, that you didn't review this or have somebody else read it or anything like that. So do not ever ignore basic syntax, basic uh, composition rules, because it will bite you in the butt, literally. No good outcome there. So now the last topic, the last topic in this chapter is effective speaking. And um, I know many people are distressed about public speaking. I don't know why. Uh, I confess, even though I've been doing this for almost 30 years, that I'm not anxious or nervous or distressed, but every single time I walk into a classroom, it is my objective to give you the best experience, the best learning environment I can. I set high standards for myself, and I don't want to disappoint you. So to some degree, I've got that level of nervousness or anxiety because I want to perform well. I want to give you the best learning environment I can. So all I'm saying is even though I've done this for decades, I feel some degree of nervousness. My nervousness is not that I can't perform, that I'm going to come up short, that I'm going to make a mistake. Heaven forbid we all make mistakes on a regular basis. But my concern is I want to, I want to meet the highest standards. I want to meet your expectations. So. But because I do this a lot, and, and even when I was in the Army as, as a young man in my early 20s, I did public speaking, and I just, I don't, I don't understand why some people find it so distressing, and yet I see it with my students. I see people almost collapse, almost faint 
in classroom settings if they have to make an oral presentation. I don't understand that. We're all going to be patient because we're all the same kind of flawed, imperfect human beings that you are. So here are the things that the authors talk about. The first thing they say is do really significant preparation. Um, I get to interact with you on a regular basis, so we have history. Uh, you know what to expect, and I hope I don't ever disappoint you. But oftentimes, when you make a presentation, it's not to a group with whom you interact on a regular basis. So in a legitimate sense, you are on stage, aren't you? Um, so they talk about rehearsing, not just I do this, if I'm making a presentation, I will rehearse it in an empty room. I will time myself, I'll work on transitions from one topic to another, uh, when it's time to pause, whatever the case may be. So rehearsals are huge. Uh, again, uh, I don't rehearse my, my classroom presentations because it's in a domain where I have a fair amount of knowledge and experience, and I've been doing this for a relatively long time, and, and, and I have a, um, a body of work from which I can draw. So I, I don't, uh, believe me, I take this seriously, but I don't, it's not that I'm making a presentation to a group of people and this is a once-only thing, like at an annual conference, or I'm trying to sell something to a group of purchasing agents, or whatever the case may be. You have to rehearse. You have to stand in a room and practice saying this stuff. You have to pay attention to time. Uh, if you rehearse, you'll find those awkward places where you can build a better transition in your own notes. Um, the next thing that they talk about clearly is they say, what are the needs of your audience? I know what the needs of my audience are if I'm in a classroom setting, but I'm not always in that sort of a situation and you won't always be in that sort of a situation. Are you going to be presenting something to a big boss? That's entirely possible, aren't isn't it? You're going to be presenting something to a vendor, to a banker? You're going to be interacting with, with an accounting firm and trying to... Uh, suggest a course of action or, or whatever the case may be or financiers um, who's your audience what are their needs what are their expectations because you must meet their needs and their expectations you must um, and this thing about public speaking is really critical for most career paths um, there aren't many of you that are going to be able to hide in a cubicle you're going to have to present information in, in an oral sort of a delivery form to other people. They may be co-workers, they may be big bosses, they may be vendors, but this notion about public speaking is embedded in an awful lot of organizational roles. So you, in my view, you have to develop skills in it. Um, the next thing they talk about here when they talk about prep is they say, check the tech. Um, I know that this may sound lame, but the week before classes start, every semester at Southern, I go to each of the classrooms to which I've been assigned, and I literally power up the projectors, I make sure that the control panels on the consoles are working, because starting on day one, I'm going to use that. Now, it's pretty simple, isn't it? And, and sometimes there are problems. Uh, sometimes there are problems with the monitors, sometimes people have rearranged cables because they, they're doing funky stuff in a classroom. People are, kids are in there practicing group projects and they, they unplug cables and don't put them back. Oh dear. So my point is, if I come early and test the tech, I know that, or at least I have the sense that it's gonna function. Now, they also talk about something that I have done lifelong. I did this in the military, I've done it in business, I've done it in academia. It is well, always, for you to have some plan B. If I'm going to rely on a laptop and a projector or whatever it is that you're relying on, whatever electronic tech you're going to rely on to make a presentation, in my view, you have to have a backup plan. What if you have a laptop and it goes south on you? What if the bulb in the projector burns out? Okay, well, my backup plan would be, in a, in a business setting, I might have photocopies of my notes to pass out to you. I might require that I have a whiteboard in the room so that I can get active with a, with a marker. You see my point? If your primary tech is electronic, or if it's a projector, if it's anything like that, if the tech fails, you cannot be adrift. You have to be able to quickly backfill, whether that is to use a whiteboard or to have handouts or whatever the case may be. So the argument that they make when they say, check the tech, they also talk about coming up with an alternative path for delivery. And if you're gonna make one of these one-off presentations, you better be prepared. Now that may mean that when you go back to your office, you've got 
you know, 30 little uh, stapled packets of information that you didn't use, okay, much better to be prepared than not, isn't it? So please be sensitive to that in terms of preparation. Um, one of the things that people expect in, in a setting like this is they expect you, the presenter, to demonstrate competence. And that's hard for me to give you any guidance. Oftentimes, you will be in that room the most knowledgeable person on that particular topic, oftentimes. And it's not, most of us pretty quickly pick up on who is confident, who is knowledgeable. Uh, we also want to see humility. We don't expect everybody to know everything. But I want to tell you a story about demonstrating competence, and, and this is not, I, I hope, I hope you interpret the story not as being cocky or arrogant because it was really neither. Um, when I returned from Vietnam, I, was, I held the rank of first lieutenant and uh, I was assigned to the United States Army Infantry School as a resident instructor. So I was teaching uh, American officers and, and allied officers from 55 countries. One of the courses that I taught was a land nav course, land navigation in the infantry officers advanced course. It's sort of a, like a master's program for career officers. If you're a captain or a major and you're gonna be a career officer, you go through this IOAC thing. It's about a nine or 10 month course. It's like, literally, it's like an MBA, but it's just in the military sciences. And of course, mine was in infantry, uh, not, in, not in another branch. So I was teaching at the infantry school at Benning, and this is a classroom setting. It looks like our tiered classrooms on, on the first floor of the Parker College, except these rooms were probably configured to seat 250-ish or something like that. So I'd have a couple of hundred career officers in the room, and for the first five or six months that I was teaching at the infantry school, I was a first lieutenant. I was promoted to captain, which was later was the same rank that most of them held, but the first five or six months I was there, every soldier in the room outranked me. Well, rank in the military is a big deal. And some people are silly and arrogant about rank. They think because they outrank you, they're smarter. In, indeed, they have legitimate authority over you, but that doesn't mean that they're smarter or better at anything. And uh, I don't remember what I was saying. This was probably like a one and a half hour classroom presentation on land nav, and I don't remember specifically what we were talking about. It could have been anything. It could have been aerial imagery interpretry. It, it could have been dead reckoning or orienteering. Don't know, it doesn't matter. But I was talking about something in this land navigation presentation and some major asked me a question and it was just dripping with arrogance. He said in these exact words, he looked around and raised his hands and he said, why would any of us listen to a first lieutenant? Because every other man in the room was a captain or a major. They were all, they, they outranked me, literally. And, and I thought for a moment and I said, sir, you have to be polite because the guy outranks me. I said, I'm on the land nav committee here at the infantry school, and I said, I know 15 or 20 men who know as much or more about this topic as I do, and none of them are in this room with me. Now I get it that that's blunt and it's harsh, but the thing that cracked me up, apparently this guy was like the resident jerk in this training company, and when I said none of those other men are in the room with me, the other 200 people in the room clapped because I, I responded bluntly to this guy's challenge. Now, that may or may not have been the best response, but it was authentic. There were 15 or 20 men at Benning that knew as much or more I did about that topic, but none of them were in the room. So I am then, I was then the domain expert on land nav. And I was standing on that stage because I had the experience and the training and the education to present that information to them. So I don't care how you do it. You have to find a way early in your presentation to demonstrate competence. It, it could be by virtue of your education, your experience, research. It could be a blend of all of those things. But confidence shows quickly. If I listen to you and, I am, and it's clear to me that you understand what you're talking about, not only am I relaxed, I'm engaged because I know that I'll benefit. You know more about whatever this topic is than I do. So I'm, I'm gonna listen to you. So you have to find ways. And again, I don't think it's difficult. Don't, don't be sassy or arrogant or self-absorbed, but find ways to demonstrate your competence. 
Um, and, and I can't necessarily know what that might mean. Here's, here's the classic example. You might say something like, Daniel, one of the two engineers here today, was, uh, was a lead engineer. He's a mechanical engineer, works for Daniel Defense. He was a lead engineer in a project that brought the Delta V to market, a very well-regarded long-range precision rifle, about a year and a half ago or so. And if Daniel were making a presentation, if he said to the listeners in this presentation, he said, I'm a mechanical engineer, Daniel Defense. I was, uh, I was a lead engineer on this particular project. Boom, I know his degree, I know where he works, what he does, and I know that he had a lead role in designing this extraordinary product. That could be the opening sentence, couldn't it? There's no arrogance there. Those are all simple, factual assertions. So find a way You'll have to do this individually. There's no guidance that I can give you. Find a way so that you early on in the presentation can demonstrate that you have some command over this domain. You know something about it by virtue of your accomplishments, your experience, your education. Don't be cocky, but deliver the message in a way that puts me, the listener, at ease. I think, cool, you're the smart kid in the room. I need to shut my pie hole and listen. Um, And I want you to think about speaking as being a parallel delivery mechanism to writing. When you write, I don't care if it's a letter, a well-developed email, not one that's just reacting to something, but, but a well-developed email, uh, anything. When we write, there has to be some introduction. Here's what I'm gonna talk about. There has to be a body, I'm talking about it, and there has to be a conclusion. Here's what I said. So if you think about that, in the context of, of public speaking, tell them what you're gonna tell them. That's the intro. Tell them, deliver the message, thoughtfully, structured, carefully, and then tell them what you told them. Just a simple wrap up, a simple conclusion. So intro, body, conclusion in, in a composition and writing is gonna have a parallel footprint in a public presentation, in a speaking presentation. Tell me what you're gonna tell me, tell me, and then tell me what you told them. And neither the intro nor the conclusion need to be long. They just need to be engaging and, and, and rich in information. So, turns out I'm done. I love you. Um, this may be the only range day. Uh, I say that because today is 2 April, and on 3 April we go into a statewide lockdown, some kind of shelter-in-place thing. I know there'll be exceptions. I don't know what they are. You know that most of my presentations have been in the classroom. I plan to make this presentation here because I want, I want my presentations to you to be varied. I want you to look forward to viewing these videos. I want you to enjoy them. I want you to engage. I want you to learn. And, and I'm hopeful that if I, if I mix things up, if I'm Captain Kirk sometimes and Goofy sometimes and, and uh, we shoot together sometimes, I'm hopeful that, that those sorts of activities engage you, make you look forward to to, uh, to doing this because we don't have the luxury of interactions. I miss it terribly. I look forward to us getting back to face to face. But right now, that's not our reality for the spring semester. So, I love you. We're done. And uh, do good things.